How many times do you have to toss a fair coin to get 10 heads total? This is a deceptively simple sounding question. It seems like the sort of thing that high school level probability should be able to answer. Let's think about it a little bit. If I toss some number n times, what's the expected number of heads? That's very easy to calculate. We can model the coins as random variables xj that are Bernoulli of parameter 1 half. And then the event that we get heads is the event that xj equals 1. Therefore, what we're asking about here is the expected value of the sum, j going from 1 up to n, of xj. That'll be the expected value of the number of times that 1 comes up. Of course, that's the sum of the expected values. The expected values are all 1 half, so that's n over 2. So it seems that we can answer this question by saying we want to choose the n so that n over 2 is 10, meaning 20 tosses to get 10 heads. But is that really a rigorous argument? Not the way that the question is stated. Here's what we actually have. We have a sequence, x1, x2, etc., of iid Bernoulli 1 half random variables. And what we're asking about is the expected value of a certain random time. That is, if we let tau k be the first time at which the sum equals k, we want to know what's the expected value of tau 10. That's the question. That is not what this answers here, where n was a fixed deterministic time. Now, fortunately, this is a nice kind of time. If we let fn be the sigma field generated by the random variables x1, x2, up to xn, then we can easily see that this is a stopping time. Indeed, the event that tau k equals n is the event that the sum of the first n x's does equal k, and that no smaller sum equals k. Since these are all non-negative terms, that's the same as saying that the sum j going from 1 up to n minus 1 of xj is equal to k minus 1. And this event is, of course, determined by the values of x1 through xn. So that is in the sigma field, fn. So that tau k is a stopping time, at least. Which means that the following theorem we're about to state and prove will allow us to make this argument rigorous. The theorem is called Wald's identity, or Wald's equation, or Wald's lemma. If xn is an iid sequence of random variables, and if tau is a stopping time relative to the filtration generated by the process xn, then if I have any function f that is either positive or such that f at xn is L1, and in that case we need to assume that the stopping time has finite expectation, then we can compute the expected value of the sum of the first tau incidences of f of x. And in that case, it works out exactly as if tau were a deterministic time which means that tau would have value expected value of tau. The independence would then give that this is the expected value of f at xn for any n, so let's say f at xn, times the number of terms, which is the expected value of tau. And that's Wald's identity, which holds true for any stopping time under these conditions. So let's prove that right now. We'll start under the assumption that f is non-negative, which will handle the coin tossing example that we just examined. And then we'll circle back to say what kinds of convergence conditions are required in order to prove the theorem in the case where f is not necessarily positive, but satisfies these conditions instead. Well, the expected value that we're interested in, we can simply write that as the expected value of the countably infinite sum of all these terms times this random variable here, we're cutting off that sum to be zero when n is bigger than tau. Now I'm going to put the expected value inside the sum, and that's perfectly justified here by Tonelli's theorem, because all the terms inside are measurable and non-negative when f is a non-negative function. Now to analyze that, we note the following. 
the event that n is less than or equal to tau is the complement of the event that tau is less than n, which is the event that tau is less than or equal to n minus 1. And that is in the sigma field fn minus 1. So therefore, by the dube dinkin representation, there exists some function fn so that that indicator function is this Borel measurable function fn of the random variables x1 through xn minus 1. So that means that this expectation can be written as the sum n going from 1 up to infinity of the expected value of little f at xn times capital fn of x1 through xn minus 1. But this sequence of random variables was assumed to be independent. And therefore, this expectation factors as the product. But now we just return that fn to the form that it was. That's just the indicator function that n is less than or equal to tau. And so to conclude the proof in this positive f case, what we need to do is show that this sum here is equal to the expected value of tau. And that's a general phenomenon which is sometimes goes under the term layer cake representation. That is, that sum of expectations there, well, inside we can write a further sum over all the actual values of tau. So that's the sum over n and the sum over k greater than or equal to n of the expected value of the indicator of the set where tau equals k. Of course, that's the probability that tau equals k. And now we can reverse the order of summation. If we're going to sum over all n and then over all k bigger than or equal to n in that upper triangle, if we instead sum first over k, then we're then going to be summing over all of the n below k, the probability that tau equals k. But we can take that probability outside of that sum, and so that's just the sum of all n's less than or equal to k, which is k. So that's the sum k going from 1 up to infinity of k times the probability that tau equals k, which of course in this discrete random variable setting is exactly equal to the expected value of tau. And so that concludes the proof of Wald's identity in the case where f is non-negative. Now, in the case where f is not assumed to be non-negative, but we know that these terms are in L1, well, then we can repeat the exact same argument we just went through, but apply to the absolute value of f. And so we'll get all the way down the exact same conclusion but with an absolute value of f there. And now under the additional assumption that this expectation of the stopping time is finite, since f is in L1, this will be finite, and so this whole thing will be finite, and that will allow us to make the same argument one more time without the absolute value, where the only place of concern, this interchange here, is justified by Fubini in this case, instead of Tonelli that was allowed in the positive case. One way or another, we have now proved Wald's identity. Let's look at another fun elementary probability application of this that you can try out at parties if we ever get to go to in-person parties again. Roll a die. You get some number between one and six. Now, whatever number you got, roll the die that many times again. Now, add up the values of all of those rolls, not including the first one. What's the expected sum of the d rolls after you determine d by first rolling the die? Well, we can analyze this using Wald's identity as follows. Let's let dn be a sequence of iid die rolls. Okay, so that just means that the distribution of dn is uniform on the set from one up to six. And we'll single out D0 as D, that first roll that we're interested in. We let Fn 
be the sigma field generated by d0 through dn. Now, we roll that first die, d0, and we determine its value. Well, its value is going to be some number k between 1 and 6. Since d is d0, that's in the sigma field f0, which is certainly contained in the sigma field fk. And so that shows that d is a stopping time relative to this filtration. Now everything inside here is positive, but also we'll have finite expectations for everything, so there's not going to be any technical problem in applying Wald's identity, which will tell us therefore that the expected value of the sum, j going from 0 up to d, we have to include that 0 because it's included in the sigma field, of dj is equal to the expected value of any one of these identically distributed independent terms, so let's say d0, times the expected value of the stopping time d. But d and d0 are the same, and so this is just the square of the expected value of d. Now, this is going to tell us the expected value of the sum of all of the dice that we rolled, including the first one that we rolled just to determine how many times to roll again. So if we want to know the expected sum of the dice after we roll the first one, we just write this as the expected value of d0 plus the expected value of the sum j going from 1 up to d of dj. And that's the quantity that we wanted there. So we see that it is equal to the expected value of d squared minus the expected value of d. And now you can calculate that. The expected value of d is 3.5, and so this comes out to 8.75 as the expected value of the sum. If you're very bored, it might be fun to do a bunch of trials of this experiment and see how accurate that turns out to be. For our purposes, still thinking a little bit about Markov chains and stochastic processes, let's see how Wald's identity can help us in the calculation of expected return times and passage times. Let's think again about the gambler's ruin problem, which was a problem associated to random walks, either biased or symmetric on the integer lattice. So let's let xn be such a random walk whose one-step transition probability of moving right is p between 0 and 1. In the case p equals 1 half, we have the symmetric or simple random walk. Well, we can construct that Markov chain as a progressive sum of iid random variables, xck, where these xck have distribution p times a point mass at 1 plus 1 minus p times a point mass at minus 1. Now, in starting this sum at 1, what that means is that I'm assuming that x0 equals 0. But if we wanted to start it at some other state, we would just add in a term c0, which is a constant equal to the starting state that we want. So, of course, we've spent a bunch of time considering questions like, how long does it take to reach a particular state k starting at another state? So now we'll start at state 0. And, of course, the problem will be invariant under translations. And so that's good enough to understand. This is our canonical example of a stopping time, in fact. Well, we can actually at least attempt to use Wald's identity to calculate the expected value of tau. And the way we can do that is to note that if I take the process x at time tau, by definition, that's just k. If I take the expected value of both of those, of course, that tells us that expected value is k. But by this explicit construction of the process, this is the expected value of the sum, and going from 1 up to tau, of xn. And Wald's identity will tell us that that is the expected value of any one of the terms times the expected value of the stopping time tau. Well, we know what the expected value is here. We can calculate that from this distribution. It's equal to 1 times p plus minus 1 times 1 minus p. And so we have an equation for the expected value of tau, which is an equation that in an earlier lecture we 
stated but didn't derive after doing a similarly lengthy calculation for the probability that it's finite. So this is a real nice quick and dirty way to get that answer. Oh, wait a minute, there's a problem. If say k is positive and p is less than one half, then the denominator is negative and this expected value is gonna be negative, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a non-negative valued random variable. Well, in fact, we did prove that in this case where p is less than one half, so we're moving with bias to the left, the probability of ever reaching any state to the right is not one. There is a positive probability of never reaching it. And that means that this expected value is infinite in that case. And if we think about this a little bit, what we see is that we have improperly used Wald's identity here. Wald's identity, which is this equality, holds true if we're taking a function of the process that is non-negative, but that's not true here. These CNs can be positive or negative. Or if the terms are all in L1, that's fine. And we know a priori that the expected value of the stopping time is finite. And we see what's gone wrong here. Without the foreknowledge that this is finite, we can get a nonsense answer by trying to improperly apply Wald's identity. But we do get something from this. We get that if we know the stopping time has finite expectation, then its expectation must be this. And that turns out to be the right answer in the case where this has finite expectation, which is where k and p minus 1 minus p have the same sign. So the upshot is that if we had some quick way to prove that the expected value is finite in that case, then we wouldn't have to calculate its value. We'd know what it is from Wald's identity. Now, I'll be honest with you, off the top of my head, I don't know any way to show that this is finite in that setting without actually calculating it in the process. But maybe one of you does. But we can derive, at least in the case p equals 1 half, the symmetric random walk, something rigorously from here. Here, we can deduce the following. If the expected value of tau was finite, then this calculation would show us that for any k not equal to zero, k is equal to the expected value of c1 times that finite expected value of tau. That would follow by Wald. But in the case where p is equal to 1 half, this is zero. And of course, we can't have a finite number here times zero equals some non-zero number k. So that is a contradiction here. And we can conclude, at least from Wald's identity quickly, that for the symmetric random walk, the expected time to reach any state other than zero, starting at zero, must be infinite.